to share an example from Harry Potter. And we're not going to focus on the magic. We're going to focus on some of the characters. And in the fourth book, which is their fourth year at Hogwarts, they get together and Dumbledore brings out the Goblet of Fire. And they don't really know what it is at first. And he says, if you're a certain age, you can come and throw your name in. And you're going to be chosen, possibly, to compete in this tournament for fame and riches. And so a lot of people are kind of bent out of shape because they're not old enough and they want to enter. And Harry's friend Ron is one of those people. He wants to enter the tournament for the money. And it seems like Harry is kind of the only one who's not old enough, but he also doesn't really care to enter. He kind of wants to say, that's cool, you guys are trying to enter. But he, he doesn't really have a desire to. So after the week is up, they take the goblet in, and it presents the names. And it picks the three to compete in the tournament. And they start to pull it off the side of the stage, and it kicks out a fourth name, and it's Harry. He's chosen for the tournament. He didn't want it. And over here, that night, in their dorm, Ron's like, how did you do it? How did you get your name in? Harry's like, I didn't, I didn't put my name in. And Ron won't believe it. And there's about 150, 200 pages of infighting with Harry and Ron. They won't talk to each other. They send their other friend, Hermione, to go kind of create in between for them. They won't submit and take the first step to resolving the friendship. If you guys would open your Bibles to Ephesians 5, we're going to be starting in verse 21. And as you do that, what, what this section of Scripture is, is back then it was very popular for a lot of writers to give a, an ethical treatise, if you, if you will. So they would write about ethical, and ethical situations and how the home should be laid out. And so Paul borrows from that. He uses a very similar layout of the marriage relationship first, the parent-child relationship next, and then slave-master at the end. This was a normal writing technique for um, people who wanted to write about the ethical situation of the home. And in previous sections, we've seen Paul talking about unity in the body of Christ and walking in the light and we're really getting into the application of the book of Ephesians. And so in Ephesians 5, starting at verse 21, and this comes kind of at the very end of what Tori spoke about last week. And it says, submitting or submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so I thought about that, and I said, well, what is submission? Because my, my wife's brothers are all in wrestling. They're super big in wrestling. And for them, I, I talked to her dad, and he was like, well, there's a submission hold, and it's essentially you trying to get your opponent to do what you want. And so I'm thinking about that, and I'm like, I'm not too sure if that's what Paul's got in mind here. Um, so look it up. And submission is this idea of yielding to the will or authority of another person. Um, so in other words, Paul wants us to yield to another person, to set aside our own personal preference and freedom. And he says that we're supposed to do that out of reverence for Christ in this verse. In this, we're going to look at three examples. Paul, this is where Paul starts to give examples. And uh, I'm going to try to clarify those. But he gives three examples. Like I said, the first is the uh, marriage relationship. The second is parent-child relationships. And the third is master-slave relationships. And just to kind of close out the idea of what is submission. The opposite of submission is the statement, why should I do fill in the blank if they would never do that for me? And we see that evidenced in Harry Potter with Ron and Harry. They, neither of them will go and make it right because he says, why, he doesn't want it, he's not going to do it for me, so I'm not going to do it for him. Neither of them will submit. So first, Paul addresses husbands and wives. I'm just going to go ahead and read it. It's uh, Ephesians 5:22. He says, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. 
that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So Paul begins this section by addressing the wives. And I just want to deal with some contention there. He does this because he's talking about submission. I have a hunch that if he was talking about leadership, he would address the husband first. But he's talking about this idea of being able to set aside your own freedoms and your own preferences for another. And so the way God has designed the marriage relationship, someone has to lead. And so he begins with wives as a way of saying, listen, you're valuable and you have the task of submitting here. And we're going to look at the husbands in a second because they're not off the hook. Also, his address to wives is much shorter. It's only three verses, and then he talks to the husbands, and it's eight verses. So keep that in mind. But then he turns, and he addresses husbands, and he tells them to love their wives as Christ loved the church. And this, this is a tall order. Um, we talked about tonight that the nature of Christ's love for us is sacrificial. That means he gave himself up. He died. He gave up everything. That he was that was his, that he viewed was his preferences. He put that aside for us and he died. So it's a sacrificial love. Paul also uses the word nourish and cherish. And these kind of cherish kind of gets lost on us today because when we think of cherishing something, we think of like a sack of money that we cherish. It's got value. That's not really what the idea is here. Cherish to them means to care for it. He uses a similar word later when he talks about talks about kids and their parents, he talks about cherishing, he uses a similar word. And so the idea of nourishing and cherishing is nourishing is loving them in such a way that brings them up and causes them to be the best person that they can be in Christ. And cherishing means caring for them, loving them in such a way where they understand that they are valuable to you, to Christ, and that they have a purpose. When Paul tells husbands to love their wives, it's a super tall word. Husbands ought to love their wives as Christ loved the church. Jesus died for the church. And then at the end of the section, Paul recaps. He says, he comes to verse 28. No, I lied. Verse 33. He says, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. He caps off the end of the section by saying, okay, so husbands, you need to love your wives but also wives respect your husbands. And what he's doing here is he's pointing out that the idea of submission is that it's mutual submission. He's telling husbands, you need to love your wives, you need to submit to your wives in such a way that when they come to you and they're called to submit and respect to you, it's not a task, it's a pleasure. He wants husbands to love their wives in such a way where when the wife, it comes to her turn, there's not a tension there, because it's a joy and a pleasure, and it's a, it's a delight. However, many believers in Ephesus and today are not married. And so Paul turns to children and parents to look at the idea of submission. And I think it's interesting, because everyone has been someone else's child. So in Ephesians 6, 1 through 4, he says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. 
This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So again, he starts off by the one who is lower. He starts off with the child, and again, this isn't a quality of lower. This is a positional submission leadership idea of being lower. So he starts off with the child. And they're supposed to submit to their parents, obey them, as in the Lord. Unlike the discussion with husbands and wives, he spends a lot more of this one, three out of the four verses, on children. There's a contrast. He quotes the Ten Commandments, saying that this is the first command, honor your father and mother, that's the first command, with a promise. And I think the idea of the promise is wrapped up in this, is the idea of honoring. Um, when I was little, my mom would tell me to clean my room, as most moms do. And I would go, and because I wanted to go out and play, I'd grab all my stuff and I'd throw it in the bottom of my closet or stuff it under my bed. And then I would straighten a few things on my headboard. And then I'd be like, okay, I'm good. And then I'd kind of go back out and play. And on my way out, without fail, my mom would say, did you clean your room? She knew I had. She knew I had gone in there and thrown everything in the corner and tried to make it look really nice. She always asked me. She's given me a chance to own up to it. See, obeying your parents means tossing all the stuff in the closet and straightening a few things. But honoring them means going in there and actually cleaning it, putting it away, folding it, tucking it in the drawer, and maybe even like dusting and vacuuming. There's a distinction here. You can submit to your parents, but true submission is one that honors your parents. It's not just doing the bare minimum. It's saying, okay, well, this is what they really desire, and I'm going to seek that out. It means, for me, putting aside the wanting to go outside and play, to say, okay, my mom would really appreciate it if I cleaned my room properly. And then the idea with the promise is that the parents are the ones who take care of us, guys. When we honor them, the promise here is tied to the land of Israel. And it says that you will, you will go well with you, you may live long in the land. And if there's contention between you and your parents in the land, it's not going to be enjoyable to live long. Turning to address the parents, Paul gives two instructions. The first, don't provoke your children. And the second, bring them up in the Lord. And so to provoke someone means to put situation and circumstance on them that is either unfair or not exactly able to be lived up to, to a point where it causes them to either sin or hold a grudge or be spiteful. So this idea of provoking, and we've you know what the idea is, it's like keep provoking and prodding and just going after them. They're supposed to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And that, we discipline the ones we love. And so to just say, well, you did something wrong, but it's, it, you're going to do better next time. Just keep, you know, just try better next time. It's not, it's not enough. We've got to show them this is wrong and make sure that they know the consequence as well as why they're receiving the consequence. Because it doesn't do any good if the parent comes along and says, well, don't do that and you're grounded. Why am I grounded? What is wrong with what they did? That's where the instruction comes in. The training and instruction of the Lord. They're supposed to instruct as well as discipline. The idea of mutual submission here is that parents are supposed to discipline and love their children in such a way where it makes obeying, submitting to their parents, a joy and a pleasure. And finally, what about those outside of our family? Because so far we're talking about marriages and we're talking about parents and children, but what about the people who aren't in our homes, 
Paul turns to the idea of bond servants and masters. And before I read this, I just want to kind of throw something out there. I want us to think of the slaves or the bond servants as employers or, or employees. And I want to think of the masters as employers in our context today. So I'm going to read it. It's uh, Ephesians 6, 5. It says, bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by way of eye service, as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bond servant or free. Masters do the same thing, and stop your threat, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and that there is no partiality. Slavery was a very different thing in their culture, and the biggest difference between what we think of as Western slavery, or slavery as we know it in the United States, is that it was not typically racial. Slavery to us is tied to race, and as sad as that is, that's how Americans think of it. But a lot of times in their culture, people would sell themselves into slavery to kind of gain a standing in society. And that sounds crazy, but that's how the culture worked. Slaves were expected, and they had them, and it was very common. So Paul says, servants, or employees, obey your earthly masters, or employers. Employees, obey your earthly employers with a sincere heart as you would Christ. I've had a few bosses in my life that were not believers, and it's very hard to work with them because they have a different standard than you. But here Paul is saying, you got to obey them, and not just obey them with a sincere heart as you would obey Christ. And he isn't saying obey them to the point where if they call you to do something against Christ, you know, you got to, no, he's saying obey them with a sincerity that looks like the sincerity you have when you obey Christ. If they're calling you to do something against Jesus, Jesus trumps that. That's not what he's saying here. He's, he's saying your attitude when you obey them, when you submit to them, needs to be sincere. And often when we, when we come to our employers, especially if they're not believers and they hold to a different standard, it can be really easy for us to say, well, I'm just going to kind of give this 50% because they don't ultimately care. That's not, it's not okay. Paul is saying, you guys got to do it wholeheartedly. You got to be in it. Christ has our reward, and we need to keep that in mind. And he looks to the masters. Paul turns to the masters or the employers. And he says, do the same to them. Paul turns to the masters and says, you need to do the same to your slaves as your slaves are being told to do to you. Employers, you need to be doing the same thing for your employees as your employees are trying to do for you. And what if that's treating them with a good will, as from the Lord, treating them sincerely. All those things that Paul gave as an instruction to the servants and the employees to carry over. And then he tells them to stop their threatening. Because in their culture, a slave was disciplined by a threat. And it was either a threat of injury and sometimes a threat of death. And then he closed it off by saying, everyone is someone else's servant. And God is ultimately every person's master. And we're all going to answer him. The idea, again, is that employers should submit to their employees in such a way that making their working conditions good to a point where when they work for their employer, it's a joy and a pleasure. And likewise, the employee should work in such a way that it makes their employer's leadership a pleasure. It makes the mutual submission a joy and not a task. I'm going to give an example of this. Uh, we're going to return to Harry Potter because that's what I'm reading right now, and it's got a lot of good examples. And the example is Dobby. 
And Dobby's a little house elf, and in Harry Potter they have a species of elves who serve, they are slaves. And that is their lot in life. And Harry Potter frees Dobby. And Dobby's old master, the Malfoys, was not very good to Dobby. Punished him, made him do really ridiculous stuff. And so when Harry frees Dobby, he's excited. But then a book or two later, Dobby's a slave again. But he likes being a slave again because he's a slave to Dumbledore. And he works at Hogwarts. See, he's, he's still working for somebody. The difference is, on the one hand, he's working for the Malfoys, who treat him poorly. And over here, he's working for Dumbledore, and it's a joy and a pleasure. And submitting to Dumbledore, it's not a hardship. And he loves it. So Paul gives three examples of submission. And the challenge and the implication of all three is that as believers, we need to submit to each other in such a way that when we interact with each other, it's a joy and a pleasure. It's not a task. But what if they don't hold up their end of the deal? What if the other person doesn't submit to us? I'm an American. I deserve my freedoms, and I deserve this, that, and the other. What if we're just difficult? That person's hard to deal with. That, you know, that's just who they are. Remember Harry and Ron. Until somebody moves first, there's conflict. If we can't learn to submit to one another, both in the household and as a body of Christ, we can't have the unity that Paul has been talking about in Ephesians. It doesn't work. Paul calls husbands and wives to submit whether the other side does or not. He calls kids to submit to their parents, whether their parents deserve it. And he says, employees and employers, you guys need to submit to each other, even if one, even if the employee doesn't work right or the employer is harsh. Because if we submit, unity is possible. And unity pleases God. And we have to make the first move. We have to be willing to make the first move. I'm going to jump back to Ephesians 5.21. It says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. He gives us our reason right there. What if, they, what if they don't do it themselves? I'm an American. I deserve my freedom. He says, You need to submit to each other out of respect for Jesus. He leaves it at that. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for this night. I thank you for this class and just the opportunity we have to dig into your word, just find great truth there, Father. Thank you for Fisher, Jonathan, and Timothy, and just what they shared tonight. We pray that you would use all of our words to change our lives, God. As we go from this place, I pray that you would just give us open hearts to receive your spirit's work, willing hands to do it. We love you and thank you.